and my mind will stay, stay on Jesus. Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Good morning, royal priesthood. What an honor to be able to say that among all of you. I have been so humbled this weekend as I've heard your stories, as we've talked and shared with one another, it is a, just a magnificent blessing to be here. And you know, when I was a little girl, I never would have thought that I would be here in this very moment. But God knew, he knew from a long time ago that we would all be together and I would be able to experience this incredible blessing. Not only to be here with all of you, but I also want to say with someone very special to me, my friend Trista Wilson. I love her so much. I'm very grateful that she's here. She's a wonderful woman. <laughs> Means everything to me. Well, you know, I'm, I'm 54 years old, and I've never been married, and I never had children. But that was not my plan. I grew up wanting to be just like my mother. She, had, she was married at 18, had three children. I was the last of two older brothers. And I wanted to be just like her. We had a great relationship. She was my best friend for uh, most of my life. And so I aspired to be like her and to have even a daughter like me. <laughs> of course. Why would you not? And, you know, so I'll be brief because I'm going to be teaching in the, in the other two workshops. But um, I worked really hard at being like my mother in the sense that I wanted to be married and to have a family. And I started off with a plan. I am a huge planner. I am all about the plan and the process. Any of you like that? Yeah. And when you go off that plan, it just drives you cuckoo. Yeah. And so... Uh, yeah, I had my plan. I was going to be the homecoming queen, <laughs> the president of the student council, married at 18, children at 24, going to have three, and I was going to travel around the world and do all these fantastic things. And you know what? That stuff didn't happen. <laughs> that was my plan. That was not God's plan. And it was really hard trying to figure that out and to um, really trust God and submit to his ideas, his will. But through the art of pottery, I've been learning to do that, and I still am learning today. I certainly do not feel like a professional in any way about this. But um, it's the way that God's taught me uh, who he is and how he works in my life, and so it's just icing on a cake to be able to share it all with you. Well, I dated, and I dated, and I dated, and I'm embarrassed to say how much I dated. I, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm serious. It, I'm, it was crazy. I, <laughs> I, I joined all the dating groups, you know, uh, Great Expectations, eHarmony, all the online stuff. And Great Expectations, I was so bad. I not only had a membership in Indianapolis, but also in Chicago. <laughs> and I looked through, I'm serious, thousands of profiles looking for Mr. Right. It was crazy. And you know that if you want a man that bad, <laughs> then, you, <laughs> then you've probably compromised some values as well. And I did, and I am not proud of that. I regret that I did all of these things that I said I would never do. And it's hard to confess that every time I get up, but it's the truth. I'm just not the woman that you might see on the outside. Not anymore. Thanks to the evolution of royalty. I'm a new person. Well, you see, from Ecclesiastes 2, and I'm going to give you several verses, and they're all on my website, peacefulpottery.com, peacefulpottery.com. Ecclesiastes 2, 10 through 11. 
I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all my hands had done and what I toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And thankfully, um, at one point, I was in my mid-30s, and it was a marvelous uh, time. Uh, I was dating Mr. Wright, thought I was anyways. Well, that, long story short, that ended. It, he was not Mr. Wright. So um, there was a weekend, I was living in Flint, Michigan. It's where I grew up, went to the Bristol Road Church of Christ. And uh, my friend Jeannie and I went to see Regis and Kathy Lee. Do you remember that program? Yeah. Now it's Kelly and Michael, yeah. right. Well, we wanted to go see Regis and Kathy Lee because Donny Osmond was going to be there. Do any of you know Donny Osmond? Yeah, okay, just checking. Yeah, yeah. I thought, this is my last chance. Yeah, I was going to go meet Donny Osmond, and I'm not kidding you. I got there in the audience, and it was a huge audience, you know, much bigger than this. And I sat in the middle row. There was an aisle, and I can remember just looking off to the side, and he was in the doorway getting ready to come out, and I caught his eye. And I waved at him, and he waved back. <laughs> can you imagine how my heart throbbed? It was crazy. But you know, he walked right by me, and that was the end. And I was, dis I was disappointed again. Finally, I got tired of that disappointment. We came home. Sure enough, my house in Flint, Michigan had been robbed while I was gone. Those crazy robbers, they took nearly everything except the good stuff. There were angels in my house. They took cakes out of my freezer, <laughs> tennis shoes. Somehow, after all the stuff they took, they missed all the great antiques and the, the beautiful jewelry of my grandmother. And so I praise God for the angels that day. But I came to that point in my career, uh, I was working very hard. And uh, I thought, well, if I'm not going to be married, then I've got, a, I've got a great career. God has blessed me with this, so then I must, you know, work really hard at it. And so I did. And I became a workaholic. I worked till, you know, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. But I just felt like, you know, this does not feel worthwhile. I went to the doctor one day. She said, everything's okay. Do you have any questions? And I said, well, yes, I'm just so tired all the time. And she said, well, do you eat right? And I said, no. And she said, well, do you exercise? And I said, no. <laughs> and she kept going with these questions and all these things I wasn't doing right. And she said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I work a lot. You know, God bless me with this career. And she said, young lady, you better get a hobby because one day you're going to retire and you're not going to have anything to do. Well, this is at a point in time where the Lord moved me to Indianapolis where I had recommitted my life to Christ. I was, I was uh, saved at the age of 12. I confessed Christ publicly in baptism at 12. And so I am, even though I was saved and I was following my own path. I really wasn't trusting the Lord or discovering his plan well enough. And so I had recommitted my life. And so when she said, you know, get a hobby, I wouldn't have anything else to do when I retire. I thought, wow, that's not only true, but, you know, from a child of God's perspective, what a horrible testimony that really is to go through life and to say, I just worked. Right? So I went ahead and I picked up a hobby. I picked up pottery. And I started making all of these pots. And I thought, wow, I've got all these pots. <laughs> what am I going to do with them all? <laughs> that seems kind of boring. It seemed worth, you know, worthless yet again. So I just sort of transferred my thinking my mind and thoughts from work to pots. It just didn't make sense. 
so I got down on my knees and I prayed to God, help me find something where I am doing something worthwhile for you that's meaningful for you, not all about me. And that's when God started sharing all these other verses for me about he is the potter and we are the clay. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate for you today. So once I realized I could be doing something much more worthwhile, and these verses about God the potter uh, started to appear, and I was praying about it, I found Colossians 1.10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. That is what God wants for us. He wants us to be spending our time in a worthy, worthwhile way, supporting who he is in his glory. And so once I committed myself, he enlightened me. From Ephesians 1.18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may know the hope to which he's called you. And I cried to God, show me that hope. I realized that my purpose now was not about finding a man, being married, having children, living a life like my mother, which was fine. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. But God was calling me to something different, and I needed to discover it. Planner as I am, and I always need to understand how. How do I do that? How do I find what you want for me to do, God? Here are the verses, 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Isaiah 30, 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left... You will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And the Holy Spirit does work through us to help us know how to fix our eyes straight before us. We're not looking backwards. We're looking forward all the time. God never says, look back. Always forward. Let that stuff go. It just clogs your mind. So, being confident that God would do this, Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. While they're still speaking, I will hear. Philippians 1, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You all know those verses, I know, but this is how they become real to me. And there are many verses um, about how God does have a plan for us. Um, This one really surprised me, though. When I was in Bible Study Fellowship, BSF International, anybody know that one? Yep, Global Bible Study Around the World. Awesome study. I was in Minor Prophets in Hosea, and I could not believe my eyes. I had, again, recommitted my life. I'm on the path of finding God. And then he says to me from Hosea 2, 14 and moving on, therefore, I am now going to allure her. That's what I wanted. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. I wanted someone to speak to me tenderly. Yeah. Therefore, I will give her back her vineyards and make the Valley of Acor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth. And it reminds me of how I was wanting to just sort of fade out that part that was my own plan and all the compromises, the bad decisions that I made, and go back to my youth. That's what this verse meant to me, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, here it is. You won't believe it. You will call me my husband. 
and you will no longer call me my master. I could not believe that in the very words of God, it says he is my husband. He's the one. He's the perfect one for me. He's the Mr. Right I've been looking for all these years. Wow. Seriously. I didn't get it. Yeah, I didn't have to look so hard. He wasn't at great expectations and out in eHarmony. He was in here in my heart. I just wasn't speaking to him. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day I will respond. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain and new wine and oil. You are my people. And they will say, you are my God. And I'm here to acknowledge he is my God and he is my husband. So there are many plans, and I dwell on this a little bit before I get started, because God took a long time to plan you. Don't think it happened quickly, or that he did it without much thought. When I was working for Hewlett Packard as a program manager, I would go into the office, I would sit in a conference room, and I'm thinking about pottery all the time. And I would look at some of those people, some of those men in this particular case. Forgive me. But I would say, that hair, that hair right there, <laughs> that one would make a great lid on my jar. <laughs> and that one, that one's got great ears, and those ears would be great handles. <laughs> and I got all kinds of ideas. So as you look at my pottery, consider <laughs> what you're seeing. Isaiah 64, 8, yet, O oh Lord, you are the father, we are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand. Yes. Jeremiah 29, 11, you know this one, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a purpose. Then you will call on me and come to pray, and I will listen. You will seek me and find me with when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And that's truth. That is why I'm here. We could go on with Romans 139. You know that one. He knows when we sit and when we rise. He knew us before we were ever conceived. He took time to think about you and about your life. It is precious to him. Every one of my pieces of pottery is precious to me, and I put them down at the exact times and places that I wanted for them to be, just like the scripture says about you in Genesis. You're here for a reason, the exact time and place today. As I plan my piece, I think about what am I going to do with it? What is the purpose? And sometimes I, you know, literally creating a plan, I'll sketch it out. And I, again, thinking about it, today I want to make a beautiful bowl, and that's going to be us. I'm going to give it some character. Character is important. I'm going to make it strong and durable. And you know, after all the trials that this piece is going to go through, it's going to wear some crowns. Can I try and get that in there somehow? There it is. Believe me, there's a bowl on there with a crown. <laughs> so I think about what kind of clay do I want to use? I've got to have clay that is just right. There's some clay that's not ready. And so uh, there's terracotta clay, there's stoneware, earthenware, all kinds of clay, bone china. Um, I prefer stoneware. It's durable. Once I'm finished working with it and it's gone through all of the trials, we can use this for greater challenges, like going into an oven, microwave, dishwasher. Yeah, right. I've got to have the right kind of clay, but it's also got to be the right consistency. Here's a piece of clay that is all dried out. And you can imagine that if I tried to 
crush or hold, mold this piece, I really can't because when I give it pressure, it just crumbles. Too much pressure on this dry piece and it just crumbles, right? It's missing something. And then here's some clay that's too wet. And when I put my hands in it, it's just like a lot of muck. And when I try to mold it with my hands, it just kind of squeezes out like wet mud. It's got too much water in it. We're the same way. You know, this dry clay, sometimes we don't have enough of the Holy Spirit. We don't have enough prayer. We don't have enough sisters in our life. We don't spend time in worship. We're not reading the scriptures enough. We're not meditating on the Lord. And when wife gives us pressure, we crumble. And this clay has too much water in it. Sometimes we've got too much of something. We might have too much time on our hands, too much time on the phone, too much time on the computer. Too much time. I'm, my problem is Facebook lately. Unless you use it for an evangelistic, evangelistic tool. That's my excuse. But sometimes this is the thing that I think is marvelous. God has blessed us with so much, really. Think about your blessings. You know? Think about our wardrobes. They're amazing, aren't they? Yeah, wardrobes. Think about you've got a car, you've got a home, heat, air conditioning, water, electricity. And we've got so much, we spend all of our time managing God's blessings. Isn't that weird? We spend more time managing the blessings of God, writing bills, trying to figure out how to pay that off. We've got so much, yet we don't have time for God, for his mission, to make him known, to evangelize around the world, to make him known in that the gospel will be shared to all nations. We manage our blessings instead. That doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah. So I need to find the kind of clay that is just right. And that's this piece. And I think about this piece as the world. And I go to the world, I find my lump of clay, and I have a wire cutting tool, I have all kinds of tools, God has all kinds of tools. And I just cut off a piece, like this. And I start working it. Now you can imagine that if this were you, it doesn't feel really good. But notice that on my face, I'm happy. <laughs> and it's not that I'm enjoying inflicting pain on this piece. I'm not. But I've got to make it ready in order to shape it. Yeah. Hebrews 12:11 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it, and they'll earn the crown of righteousness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What crown is that one? The crown of mastery, maybe? Hebrews 12, 15 through 16. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now here's how we do that. There are all kinds of bits of debris in this clay, maybe even air pockets, and I've got to get that out early on because if I don't, it can cause my clay to go off center on the wheel or even explode in the fiery kiln later on in the process. And so I've got to get its attention. Oh, 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 
and I have to wedge this piece, which is like kneading dough. And I'm putting a lot of force and a lot of pressure on this piece. God does this in many ways. Sometimes it's through the verses of the scriptures. It's a friend that says, nah, I don't think you ought to do that. You know, I'm, maybe you shouldn't go that place. Maybe you shouldn't have that thing. And there's debris, there's sin in here. And I've got to get it out. Here's a piece that I had air, uh, there was another piece in the kiln, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. But it went through the fiery kiln, had an air pocket in it, and it caused the piece to explode. It shattered in the kiln. The violence or the uh, turbulence in the kiln caused those shattered pieces to drop on my piece. And so there's, there's little fragments up here, and you can come up and see later on. But... You know, I wish it hadn't happened to that piece. I'm not happy that it happened to this piece. But you know, this is one of the first pieces I ever made, and I did not throw it out. God will not throw you out either. So I have to work this piece pretty hard, make it pliable, submissive. And I know by feeling it, looking at it, when it's just right. Okay, and now I'm ready to throw it into the center of the wheel, and that's where we get this phrase, throwing pottery. So I move over to this potter's wheel. All right. And I want to place this piece right in the very center of the wheel, the center of God's will. And that is the easiest place for this piece to be. You see, if it's not in the center, if it's off center, and I turn the wheel on, give it some power, it'll just literally fly off the wheel. Can you see it? I'm afraid it'll fly way off. And that's not good. I don't like that it's being beat up like this. I don't want it to fly off the wheel when the speed of life is turned on. And so, Psalms 42, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand, a rock of Jesus, the place to stand. And he takes me and he throws me into the center so that I will stick there. Kind of like when he moved me from Flint to Indianapolis to a church that adopted me and brought me up further in the whole knowledge of the Holy Spirit so that I could stick in the middle of his wheel on high speed. But as I put my hands on this piece, there's friction between my hands and the piece. We've got to remove the friction. And it's the Spirit of God that removes the friction between us and groans on our behalf. Removes the friction so that God, we're in alignment with God, righteousness. So I take some water and I splash it on. And now I'm going to give it a lot of force. Now my hands will slide. The friction is gone. And any time it comes back, I'll splash water on it. But with all of my heart and with all of my force, I'm going to center this piece. It's got to be centered. We have to be centered in God. It's not easy to center this piece. In fact, this is where most people give up on the art of pottery. It's hard to center the clay. You're no different. You're tough to center. But you've got to be in the center of God's will. And anytime that friction comes back, I just keep on adding water. 
And now that it is centered, look, you would think that even though the, spiel, the wheel is on high speed, my hands are not moving. That's the easiest place to be, completely centered, top to bottom, inside out, centered in God's will. Now I'm going to give this thing some shape and some character, and I'm going to start by drilling a hole right down into the center, into the very heart. That's where I'm starting, at the heart of this piece. And I'm going to bring it up into a cylinder in order to give it a little bit of shape. And as I do, you know, <laughs> where's Stephanie? Stephanie, you know what? Sometimes, are you watching? Sometimes bad things happen to us. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. God told Jeremiah, up on your feet, go to the potter's house. When you get there, I'll tell you what I have to say. So I went to the potter's house, and sure enough, the potter was there, working away at his wheel. Whenever the pot the potter was working on turned out badly, as sometimes happens when you are working with clay, the potter would simply start over and use the same clay to make another pot. Then God's message came to me. Can't I do just as this potter does, royal women of God? God's decree. Watch this potter. In the same way that this potter works his clay, I work on you, royal women of God. That version must be wrong. It was her. The potter wears a she. <laughs> no, that's not true. Those things happen in life, right? I could go on and on. If you come to my workshops, I'll tell you some more about that application. But, you know, for me, it was the death of my mother. It was breast cancer, getting through some aggressive breast cancer, lightning hitting my house and so on. I could go on. Uh, but those things do happen, right? But once I've given this piece some character, it needs to rest. This one will take a short rest. We all need rest. And in order to give it some rest, I use my lifting tools. And they also need some water so that there's no friction. And I'm going to lift this piece up. And as I do, you might even notice that the top of it turns oval instead of round, but I'm just going to set it aside over here to let it rest, and as I put it down, it will spring back into a circle. And so God says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they get older, they'll remember. Clay has memory. Train up your children. Now, God is a pure God, and this is like a cooking show. I've got some pieces already made. I'm all about the food. And here's a piece that I've already thrown on the wheel. It's that bowl that I mentioned. And if you look at the bottom of it, now this is dried out, let's say, overnight. It's resting a little bit. But the bottom of this piece is very uh, messy. It's kind of rough. So I need to turn it over and clean it up. How many of you know that God wants for you to have a clean, flat bottom? It's true. Sorry, Stephanie. So I have to wait until it's dried out a little bit. It's got to be what we call leather hard, leather like your purse. And it's, I know that it's leather hard because I can turn it on its side. I can hold it and won't collapse like this piece might. Yet on the other hand, it's still wet. I can put a mark in it. Um, but you know what? I'm the potter, and I can just blot that mark out. Put something over the top of it. Psalms 51.1 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. And there's more. Now I can turn it upside down on the wheel. I'll need to recenter it. 
upside down. Isn't that crazy? And I have a little tool here that tells me how centered it is. And I keep adjusting this piece until it's completely centered. And I'm patient with it. I'm enjoying the process. This piece doesn't know what's going on. It's just been turned upside down. And then I take a piece of clay that's the right consistency, and I need to make a coil that I can attach to the bottom of it. I just make a nice long coil. This is how God made the first snakes. <laughs> I'm going to press it into the bottom so that it will stay. I have all kinds of kitchen tools up here to clean the bottom. This one is a paring knife. No, I don't put them back in the kitchen when I'm done. <laughs> but I clean up the bottom, flatten it. Drives me crazy. Flat bottoms. <laughs> It's not easy. There. And then I take another tool. It's kind of like a little rubber, rubber-ended pen. And I put my initials in it, NH. And I give it a unique number, 5,855. That's how many I've ever made. Every piece has its unique number. If you look at all my pieces, they're unique, just like you. The Holy Spirit is God's signature on us. That unique number is your place in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've got your own line in the Lamb's Book of Life. Isaiah 49 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she's born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. That's how he does it. Now this piece needs to dry out till it's completely dry, bone dry. And once it has, then I'm ready to fire it. It's gotta go through the fiery furnace. And it goes through a couple times. The first time will make it kind of like this. You can hear it's even more firm than a piece of dry clay but it's gotta go up to about 1700 degrees Fahrenheit so that it's nice and firm. And then it has to go through a second firing process after I've put glaze on it. Glaze gives it more character. And after it's been fired the second time up to about 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, then the bowl is ready. But don't you know this bowl has been through a lot? Wow. The good and the bad and the ugly, it's been through a lot. And now it's ready. This bowl can serve people. You can put a salad in here, peanuts, M&Ms, you name it, anything. Water, water will not seep through this anymore. But because it's gone through all of that, I'm going to give it a crown. This is the crown of righteousness. Can you see that, Sister Elsie? The crown of righteousness. This is for the faithful's crown. This one is the, for those who have anticipated Christ's return. They have fought the fight. They've kept the faith, even to the point of death. And then that peace has been through so much, I'm going to give it the crown of glory. The crown of glory is the shepherd's crown. 
for those who instructed others and, and served as shepherds or as mentors, for all shepherds and mentors. And then this beautiful crown is the crown of mastery, the self-disciplined crown. For those who ran the race with self-discipline, self-control, we must train ourselves to win the race, to own these crowns. And then we have the crown of life, the victor's crown. You'll suffer all kinds of persecution, but be faithful to the point of death. One more, y'all. The crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing. And because God has done a good work in you, he has carried it on to completion. You will evangelize. You will run like the Samaritan woman to your community and you will praise God and you will tell your community that it is only he who is your husband. He is the perfect one. And we will wear these crowns eternally. The crowns are yours, sisters. Go get them. Stephanie. thine own way thou art the power